So I was like, man, what can I do to stay involved in the game and do this? And guys like Yonder, watching them on TV, I felt like I can do the same thing, but in a different way. So that's where the Digging Deep podcast came. And um, that's just kind of it, man. I, I still want to be involved. I still want to promote the game. I still want to help kids. But I'm all about these players, man. I'm not in there to bash somebody. I'm not in there to say, this guy should have swung at this pitch or why did he swing at this pitch? I'm not there, man. I want to show you how impressive these guys are, what their stories were, what they overcame. You so what's your, what's your All right, here we go, big dog. Three, two, one, boom. What's up, everybody? It's your coach. Welcome to the number one positivity podcast on the internet right now, the Coach HP Show. And today I have a guy who I'm extremely disappointed with. And I'm going to tell you why. And it's not because of this audio setup problem that we had and stuff like that. <laughs> Here's why I'm disappointed with you, bro. Talk to me. For, for a guy who wore the sweetest faux hawk of all time, <laughs> the fact that you still don't rock that, I'm upset at that, bro. So talk to me. Why are we still rocking that, bro? Hey, that's funny you say that. So next year is our 10-year reunion, and I was actually talking to some of the guys. I was actually talking to my wife, and we're like, man, maybe if my, me and my son roll up in some faux hawks to the reunion, that'd be a good idea. So there's been talks about bringing it back. I'll, I'll keep you updated on that. Bro, as a guy with no hair, I celebrate dudes like you that have a great set of hair. When did you get rid of it? Uh, I got rid of it a couple years. I would say it was about probably the first year I got out of Kansas City, man. I kind of felt like, all right, it's time to move on. Maybe we grow up a little bit, just go to the regular fade. And um, But you look at some of these haircuts now, man. Some of these guys got these big mullets with the fade on the side. And you haven't thought about that? Why don't you do that? I think that's a good look for you, but I think that's strong. I might try it, man. I tell you what, during COVID, I grew my hair out. I ended up going with like a little man bun fade. That was cool for a little bit. I won't go back to it, but I'm always open to trying new things. I think, you know, you know what that's called in Spanish, no? What we got, what we got? It's called a teja, bro. Teja, that's like <laughs> 80s. That was like Canseco shit. That was like, dude, if you had that in the 80s, you were the man, bro. Canseco was rocking that stuff back in the day, too. So. All, all, all those people, man. I was, uh, first of all, I'm so proud of you, bro. You you have no idea, man. But before I get in how proud of you I am, my boy was the pitching coach of Belen in 2004. <laughs> he played you guys at your place. He says, first at bat, you hit a bomb on right field. This, I think, is 2004 in the playoffs, right? Uh -huh. Second at bat, you hit a bomb. Left field, home run. <laughs> and then you came in and closed the game throwing 90 something. Is, is that true? Or no? Yes. And you can thank Belen for that because every time we faced Belen, man, that was, we weren't a rivalry, but we found a way to make it a rivalry. I mean, those games, there was so much passion from both teams. Both teams wanted to win so bad. And you know how that is down in South Florida, especially in Miami area. People show their passion, people show their pride. Like you were just saying, you're proud of me. That's because that's our city, man. Anybody that does something from our city, whether it's Miami, Fort Lauderdale, South, South Florida boys is, is what we always try to represent. So when we go on the national scale or the global scale, we're always representing. But Belen, man, they were the they, that was the school that brought the dog out in me because they started chirping me at the, uh, from, from their fans, and I never had that before. So somehow I started throwing cheese on the mound, hitting over. <laughs> so I thank Belen for that. Dude, how did it feel? At that age, Eric, how did it feel to be so good, man? I didn't know any better, man. I just played the game. I loved playing the game, and I wanted to win. I think that was the message that was always given to me from, from coaches, from people that I idolized, from guys that were two, three grades above me that I always idolized. It was always about winning. And for high school, it was always about winning your state championship. So I would play summer ball. I would do the showcases because everybody else was doing it. But at the end of the day, I was preparing for my high school season because – Winning a state championship was really the only goal on my mind. Who was your baseball mentor? Was it Pops? Was it somebody else? Who who guided you into that? Because if I'm not mistaken, Pops is American and Mom's a Cuban. Yes, correct. Okay, correct. so who was the baseball person there? Man, I tell you what, there's so many mentors, but just beginning with my parents. I mean, my Pops was a firefighter, City of Miami, Station 9 down there in Liberty City, so... I would watch him come back from a 72 hour shift because he would usually trade days with guys so we can go to a tournament or whatever it was in the weekend. And 
he'd come home after 72 straight hours. I'd ask him to go out in the field, do some batting practice, and he was always there. He always never said no. We always went out there. My mom, Cuban side, big family, a lot of crazy things happening with her family. But when I was a kid, it was always just the same. You know what I mean? I never knew when she had a bad day. I never knew when she had a good day. She just just filled our house with love and happiness and just so much positivity. Well, I took all that into baseball. So the days where we get in at four or five in the morning, we're getting off a plane, off a bus, whatever it is. I'm like, man, my dad's saving lives or was saving lives for 72 straight hours, comes home. He's a dad. My mom dealing with all kinds of problems. You don't see none of it. Baseball is a game of failure. You're going to be dealing with problems every single day. So I really took both of um, those little tidbits from them and carried that on into my baseball career. And then once you start baseball, man, there's there's so many mentors, so many people I look up to. But mom and dad was was uh, the beginning of all that for sure. Eric, the what little league did you play at? So I played I played uh, Cooper City for little league, and then we kind of right around like 10, 11 years old, we started doing the tournaments. Uh, we started doing uh, U SA. I was in Grapeland Park every other week, man. We were playing Latin America. No Latino Americano, we were playing them all the time, man. Back then, I'm uh, I'm big into kids playing other sports. If you're Cuban from Miami, you don't play any other sport. It's just craziness with baseball. Everybody that I talk to now that's successful in baseball plays baseball like an American thing to play other sports, right? You, did you play other sports? I did for one half of a year, my eighth grade year. The first year, we all went to American Heritage. That's when... A lot of guys on my same Little League team, we all ended up going to American Heritage. And eighth grade, a lot of the guys were playing junior high football. And I was like, man, I want to do it so bad. Those guys are all out there playing football. They're doing what they got to do and having fun. I wanted to be a part of it. So I went, did the season, have fun. And at that point in time, it was my freshman year. And I was like, all right, if I want to pursue baseball and hopefully go to college or hopefully play professionally, then I got to start, uh, you know, when it's not season, I got to train. I got to get right. I got to get strong. Um, I got to be able to go to some of these showcases where the colleges are at. So I played football eighth grade, but once high school started, I started locking in on baseball. When you tried out for these places, right? Were you in these showcases? Were you nervous? Did you know you were good enough already? Because you're in high school. My boy told me you were already six, four. Mm -hmm. So it was like, dude, that's, that's a big plus, man. There's, the, there's a lot of people get that. Were you confident? Were you not confident? Talk to me about that. I was confident, man, but there was always it was always a mystery going to a new tournament. Like I would go to the Miami camps. I would go Grapeland Park, like I said, and I'd be confident rolling into there because we're playing some of the same teams we know and I feel good about it. Then we go to one of these tournaments out of town or go to Tampa or go one of these places. And I wanted to be the best. And I didn't know if I was the best. I was confident in my abilities, but I was nervous because I wanted to to perform. And I I didn't think that I didn't know if people were out there that were better than me, if I can handle it, whatever that was. And the more and more I started traveling outside of Miami, outside of that South Florida area, I just felt like I kept gaining confidence. And then once I kind of sat back and, and watched it all and got to professional baseball and understood where a lot of these guys came from, I understood South Florida was, was some of the top talent. And that was some of the hardest battles that I would have to go through from a baseball standpoint, especially Little League. So During the time going through it, there was nerves. There was all type of stuff. But after the fact, I realized if you can get through Miami, you can go through anywhere and play. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. At that time, Eric, were you the kind of guy? Because when I'm, I think you're, you're what, 34, 35? 34. 34. So I'm, I have 10 years on you. Okay. Mm -hmm. And mine, my brother. you see that? <laughs> and, and at that time, We were working out uh, at the gym. There, there wasn't nobody would do special training and stuff like that. That wasn't that wasn't on back then. Was that at your time too, or would you do like the local high school working out? What would you What were you doing? Yeah, so I love that you brought this up because I love now on the back end of this, which I'll get to what you're doing. But the the biggest thing, man, working out. I, I was just telling somebody this the other day. It was like, dude, when you do bench press do dumbbells instead of the barbell. That's what athletes do. That's what baseball players do. And that's how far advanced it was because we were just going to work out to get strong. And that was it. It wasn't right. no injury prevention. It wasn't like twos with the arm or these heavy balls to make you throw harder. It was just to get strong. That's all we knew. And that was kind of beginning of my major league career, professional career, really 
that was a thing. Guys were going in the off season. You trained in the off season to be ready to go throughout the season. Not a lot of working out through season, but now guys are starting to do it more. But what I realized my last couple of years was everyone's working out. Everyone's working out in the off season during the season. The mental side, the process and development. So many young guys now come up so mentally strong and ready for what they're going to get into. And it's like they know adversity is coming. They don't shy away from it. They're prepared right. for when the adversity comes. So when I see positivity, when I see you doing this, this is exactly what that new wave, our new young youth, the generation of talent, these guys are all on to mastering the mental side of the game. Absolutely, dude. I work with Eric. I work with probably about six big leaders, mm -hmm. all and dudes on that, on their approach, their mental approach. I do it on all, all realms, comedians, entrepreneurs, guys are really successful, but in the baseball world. And the funny thing, I actually got back from Brooklyn yesterday, The who's my good friend, the ex-CEO of Barstool Sports. She started now. She's a new CEO of a company called Food 52. And we were in Brooklyn there, and we had uh, Erica. Yeah, yeah. Oh man, she's a rock star. The best, dude, the best. And she, and we she actually did a mastermind. Like she had us there to talk to her about her brand. Like what can she doing better and and also my boy, do you know who Wallow 267 is? No, I don't, man. You ever heard of the podcast Million Dollars Worth of Game? Oh, I definitely know that. Yeah. That's yeah, my boy. So my boy Wallow is a uh, he, okay. he he just resigned with Barcelona for like a hundred million, but him and they're amazing. So he's there, and they were just throwing ideas. And one thing dudes don't do, and especially us Latin dudes with uh, testosterone, is we don't ask for help. Yeah, you know. And, and one of the things that 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 I have a lot of empathy for you for is to be six four, good looking dude, have everything pretty much rolling your way. I felt that when you got to when you got to that point in where you really popped, because come on, to be a 25-year-old fourth batter of the World Series champion, mm -hmm. very few people can go, oh, yeah, bro, I know what that feels like. It's almost crazy, right? Mm -hmm. So I felt that you unintentionally, intentionally, whatever it is, put a lot of pressure on yourself. And at the time, imagine you would have had somebody. Like, I almost feel that if you sign for a certain amount of money, the other people, Let's say an example. Um, uh, people that signed for four hundred million and up. An example: Trout, uh, Otani, whatever. These people, by law, have to have like a committee where, oh, Eric is now. You come in and they kind of prep you for like a week. Yeah. Right. And we don't do none of that stuff. Oh man, there's there is no. I think we're getting better at starting to recognize we need to be better in these areas, but there really is no. There's no structure. There's no. That's the craziest thing, too. When you get to the professional ball, it's just you're on your own. The accountability in baseball is like you have to hold yourself accountable to everything because nobody's going to go force you to do that. No one's going to force you to pick up the phone and call somebody. It's stuff you have to go do on your own. And for me personally, I had came up in 2011. I had a great rookie year. 2012, I struggled. I struggled a lot. I just did not have a good season. I couldn't find my rhythm mentally. I was just kind of de defeating myself and really not giving me the best opportunity to go let my talent take over on the field. So I kind of remember going through that. I got through it the next year, 2013, had a great year, but I always remembered how I felt in 2012 and how I just wanted to be vulnerable with somebody. But I'm this 22 year old in the big leagues. Guys have families, guys are doing this thing. So I'm not gonna go up to this guy and be like, hey man, I'm not meant, I don't know what's happening. Cause then he's gonna think I'm not good enough to be on this team. So I always tried to hide it. So being an older player, I remembered what that felt like. And I would kind of take a notice the last couple of years of my career of seeing certain kids, seeing certain guys go through that. And I just really wanted to help them, man. I wanted to let them know, hey, I'm going through exactly what you're going through. A matter of fact, 99% of the dudes that you're going up against right now are going through what you've gone through or have been through what you're going through. So you're going to get out of this. Talk to me about what you're feeling. Let's speed that up instead of this could be a two, three year thing. So Yes, man. I, I agree with you 100%. I think when you bottle all that in, you're going to burst at some point. So to be able to release every so often is so important for guys. Eric, what leads to that, bro? Because I'm there and my biggest problem, by the way, I'm the biggest failure in the history of Miami baseball by far, dude. You have no you have no idea. Okay. I underperformed and I, I, my dad prepared me for everything in life except to deal with him. So he beat the shit out of me through base. It was like famously known, right? The poor guy just couldn't get it, couldn't get it right, you know, and he would abuse and hit me. And I was, so I had that thing, right? But 
when I heard the the interview you did with George Brett, and he goes, dude, uh, in BP, you were a one-hand finisher, and in the game, you were a two-hand finisher, and I'm watching your swing, and I'm like, bro, it's so hard to be a two-hand finisher and mm-hmm. stay through the ball, you know, because it's like, yeah. and you had a real aggressive stride, mm-hmm. which is which is hard because you drop levels and the, all these things, right? But mm-hmm. to you, what if you can remember you're on top of the world one time, and when it starts going down, what is it? Is it you don't see the ball anymore, or is that you think you're hot, but then you start telling yourself, "Oh my God, I'm 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 lost." What is it that you can remember, bro? Yeah, there there is no doubt times where you are just lost. It feels like you're standing on your head in the batter's box, and you're just like, "Man, I don't know how I'm going to get out of this. I need to get out of this, but I got five at bats tonight." And there's about 50,000 people here watching me. I got to figure out how I'm going to do this. So I think going through going through failure and and understanding that you're going to come out on top and trusting you're going to come out on top. I think the big thing with baseball is I've learned the more and more you get into these seasons, a, a professional setting of 140 to 162 games, you know what you're signing up for. You know throughout the course of the year, three to four times, you're just not going to know where you are. You're just going to – I don't know if it's a mental block. I don't know if it's uh, thinking too much, but I 100% got into, I fell in a trap of, of worrying about mechanics so much that I caught oh, myself damn. being in the box. Yeah, I caught myself being in the box, looking at two pitches go by, and I was worried about where my hands were, where they were going. No. Like, it just got to the point where I got so blocked up that I'm like, man, I just want to go out there and just see the ball. Just see the ball and break it down that simple, but – that's the thing throughout the course of a baseball season, man. You almost have to sacrifice at bats just to get yourself feeling back right so you're good for the next two, three weeks. Dude, and and if you go back now and you think about that at bat at Belen, you just saw the ball and just took hacks, bro, right? Bro, no doubt. It's amazing how that was always the feeling in high school. But you go to the next level, you start thinking, I can hit a ground ball to the pitcher and beat it out for a knock, and I'm feeling so good. But then I can go line drive – Somebody dives and catches it off the wall, and I'm right back to being pissed off. So that took a lot of years of learning the hard way and understanding, okay, I can't control the outcome. If I stuck to my plan and I held myself accountable to doing that and prepared the way I wanted to prepare, the game's just going to happen. I'm going to go have fun in the game, and I'm going to trust that the preparation takes over. Dude, I I love that, man. One of the reasons why I'm so proud of you, bro, is because when a guy finishes – and, and 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 there's there's it's almost like a catch 22 in everything you do when you're successful right you're successful early great but now it's like everything people do is on the clock so if you fuck up when you're 40 now you're a fuck up you you were great your whole life you had a, one mistake you had a DUI one day one thing happened and I ah, you fucked up there he is whatever right but what, what you've done now is I've always thought that the baseball space was always wide open because I feel that baseball is always like marketing to the 1950s. Yeah. Like it's like, hey, the good old days and baseball and blah, 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 blah. <clears throat> And it's not real. Out of all the sports, it's the fakest one. Mm-hmm. Right? And then you have American baseball players and a lot of the stars are these Latin guys, but they don't speak English and they want to be reggaeton guys. So they don't even, they, they don't even want to deal with that. And then uh, the guys are making too much money to be vulnerable. So it's almost like a fake facade thing. Mm-hmm. You know, that's why I hate when they inter- when they put microphones on players on the fucking field. Yeah. And they go, hey, hey, Eric, how excited are you to be here? No, buddy, I'm, I'm, this yeah. is stupid as fuck, bro. I wish I was on <laughs> South Beach, to be honest with you, Al. Thank you so much, bro. They interviewed you know the pitcher on the mound before starting the All-Star game. I'm with you, bro. I can't stand it. What is that? And then we've already seen a guy. A guy almost got hurt. Errors are, are happening all the place. Like, like yeah. what more do we need people to do, right? But to get to you now. When you started, so I, I was so lucky to to meet Yonder when, as he just retired, his old uh, coach put me in contact with because I'd already started my show. Dude, talk to this guy. You know, he's like, he's new. He's, he's out in the world. And I talked to him. And what I saw in him, I saw, I see a lot with you. When I saw him, I go, I go, buddy, let me tell you something. Because we did two episodes together. And I go, you're going to be the voice of baseball. I'm going to tell you right now, you're that good. Like I I just saw it, right? But when I look at you now and what you're doing, and then I look at how you're doing it, Eric, and then I saw today when you added the thing with George Brett, 
and then you put cartoons in it, I go, this guy is serious about this, man. I go, if this guy can just not burn out, this is going to be a home run. You yeah. know, and I get worried because I'm like, okay, he's doing the show, but then he's doing, you're doing uh, daily things and trade talk. And also I'm like, is this guy going to get, I get worried for you because I'm like, this guy's going to get burned out. You know, because I know the commitment of starting one of these things the right way. And you're doing it the right way. Thank you. Thank you, brother. You know you're not cutting yeah. corners. You got an audio guy. When you go to a place, you're fucking setting up the real style, dude. So I'm like, what a home run this guy's hit, especially that you're interviewing non-baseball people. The more non-baseball people you're going to get, the more home run that's going to be, whether it's comedians, whether it's fucking RFK, whether it's Trump, whoever. Yeah. That's, that's just how I have always thought about this, right? What have you learned in the past, I think you've been doing this for, what, I don't know, two months, three months, whatever it is. What have you learned now that you didn't know before? Well, man, a couple things before. Yonder is somebody that I've been looking up to when he was a starting first baseman on the Florida Bombers. And I was that freshman or sophomore at Belen, hoping to fill in his spot when he went to Miami and kind of follow his track, like Miami to the big leagues, all that stuff. So Yonder from day one is someone that I've looked up to from his playing days now I look up to him for what he's doing in the booth, broadcasting, the way he's promoting baseball, the way he's talking about baseball, because I agree with you so much. Baseball has gotten so away from baseball's core values, honestly. I mean, we, we look at games when we watch games now, what people are, what, what they're valuing in baseball, what teams are valuing in baseball. To me, it's gotten away of really showing how good and how impressive these athletes, these players are. So that was the big thing with me was, you know, I went through some situations in, in San Diego where I didn't feel like the story was told the right way. In baseball, you don't really speak on things. You just continue to go and, and don't cause distractions and keep it moving, you know. So I always wanted to get into this space. And guys like Yonder were the reason I did because it was kind of frowned upon for baseball to get into media for ex players to do this. Guys would kind of look at you a different way. But the stance that Yonder takes is the same stance I'm taking. I want to show the world how good these people are. I want to show how impressive these guys are, what they're doing day in and day out. So what I've gotten to do, and you're exactly right, bro. Having a daily show is so hard. I did want that. Now going through a full year, I don't know if I'm, if I'm ready for all that. The weekly thing is great, but I kind of took it like this is my first year as being a fan. I want to live this day-to-day -day experience like a fan with the fans. I'm going to interact with them on X. I'm going to have this podcast, the weekly thing, and then I'm going to dig deeper because like you said, man, once you dig deeper into the successful people, the routines, their processes, it all becomes the same stuff. And I think the most successful people, they treat their day-to-day -day routine pretty similar to baseball, football guys, whatever it is. So I'm having so much fun doing this. I'm learning so much. And that's kind of the thing. I want to continue to spread my knowledge with baseball it was always just guys that I played with. I would be in contact with them. I would text, how you doing? Let's talk about this. I wanted to make that bigger. I wanted to help guys I didn't know. So I'm, I'm helping guys. I'm learning all at the same time. And I love it, man. I really do. What have you learned? Like off the top of your head, what have you learned? Just kind of what I just told you. Everyone's process, no matter if you are a, a guy on Wall Street that's successful, if you are a fashion designer that's successful, or if you're a baseball player, everyone has that same drive. Everyone has that same attention to detail. And everyone always wants to continue to do the boring fundamentals, but master them day in and day out. I think everyone always tries to shoot for this big, this big thing. And I love that, but you got to build up to get there. And I think the consistency, like you're saying, and that day to day, just mastering the boring technique of it, whatever it is you're doing, I think that day-to-day -day leads to that big success. I love that because I know you've talked about going into uh, front office or this and that. I don't want that for you because what, the reason why is you have a son and I'm like, I want. I, so my claim to fame is I'm like the dog whisperer, but with kids, mm -hmm. right? With their parents and especially with sons, with their boys. And you haven't started this world yet, but because your boys, what, two, three? He'll be two in September. Two in so, September what? 11th bro dude my son is the 14th my son's okay. my son will be four right wow. so when i came back uh to miami i started working and training three four five year olds and i started seeing where the problems that you see now in society in high mm -hmm. school i started seeing it back then eric and what happens is 
that when you're successful, and remember, uh, you're you're an anomaly because you made it to the highest top, but your your cousin is doing better than his dad because that's that's why these people sacrifice and that's what's going on. But mm-hmm. what happens is our generation knew the value of discipline and the value of earning stuff because yeah. it just wasn't around, right? Mm-hmm. Now uh, Jackson is going to have everything because of who his dad is, et cetera, et cetera. And if his dad is running the Royals, an example, when Jackson goes to practice, Jackson's mom's going to take him. And the mistake I started to watch, Eric, was a kid would get out of the car. And remember, when we played, it was the fucking green sack with the helmets, and they would dump it in the thing, and three helmets, and they hit the Lysol, and the one catches the equipment, <laughs> two bats, and go have a day, you know? I don't remember the Lysol, but yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, dude, start, start getting the Lysol. So the, 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 I'm a Tamiami Park guy, bro. Oh. So we would spray the thing, and here we go. So now it's a backpack. One bat, the new transition bat, it's on. So it's two bat here, a glove, the helmet individual. It's all these things. And I noticed moms will get out of the car holding their their youngest kid, holding the kid's backpack on her back or with the kid and holding the other kid's hands. So immediately everything is wrong. Mm hmm. Right. I'm with you, man. That's my dad. My dad would go nuts on me if he found out someone carried my bag into the practice or the game. I'm with you. So that's why I want to I wanna keep you off. The more I think you do this, the better it's going to be because y- you just, you're the boss. So, hey, I, we're going to record two episodes. We're going to go to the All-Star game. We're going to go to London. We're going to go to the World Series. We're going to go to playoffs. We're going to go to the Super Bowl. I think that's a home run, man. I want to keep you in this as long as possible, bro. That's that's my vibe, dude. What have you thought about that? Thank you, man. And and that was something that I've thought a lot about when the playing days were over, because I truly felt that I still could have continued to play. I, I truly felt that I could have still went out there and made a team and, and been on a roster and been a big league player. But did I think that those positions were, were earned the right way or was it a true tryout? Was it a true fight position battle for this? I don't know if it was or not. I don't think right now in the big leagues that Every roster spot is earned and those guys should be up there. I think there's a lot of stuff that goes on behind the scenes. And that's kind of where I came to. I was like, man, like I want to be involved in the game, but I think I'm more valuable than that 25th guy on the roster. So what do I do? And I want to be at home with my son, bro. When I was with Chicago, my son was born. We went on a nine day road trip to the West Coast. So I didn't really get to check in on the phone that much. And When I came back from that nine days, man, it was like he was a different dude. And I was like, I don't like this. I don't like this at all. I want to be here with him. I want to experience this age. I want to experience his first word, whatever it is. So I was like, man, what can I do to stay involved in the game and do this? And guys like Yonder, watching them on TV, I felt like I can do the same thing, but in a different way. So that's where the Digging Deep podcast came. And um, that's just kind of it, man. I, I still want to be involved. I still want to promote the game. I still want to help kids. But I'm all about these players, man. I'm not in there to bash somebody. I'm not in there to say, this guy should have swung at this pitch or why did he swing at this pitch? I'm not there, man. I want to show you how impressive these guys are, what their stories were, what they overcame, what kind of adversity they saw on the way. So if that can help one of these kids down the road, if someone logs in YouTube and sees that and it helps one kid, for me, that's a win. So I'm still kind of trying to figure out exactly what that is. But I think this space here is definitely um, you know, what, what I'm starting to really enjoy. Dude, and not only that, but you have the podcast, but then you started a whole media thing. So what is that? What does that entail? What have you thought of with that? Just different ways to tell the story. I got lucky because one of my former teammates, Anthony Saratelli, we played the minor leagues together. He stopped playing baseball in 2015, and we always kept in contact. We became great friends over the years. He would always be in New York. He's a Jersey guy, so we'd always catch up throughout the season. He's been in the production side of this business for about 10-something years, 10-plus years. And we always kind of said, hey, man, whenever we're done or wherever I'm done, I want to think about doing something like this. So I was real fortunate to partner up with him because everything on the production end, everything as far as like the ideas that I have, I just bounce them off of him. And he's the one that kind of brings it to light. So uh, I got lucky on that end. That, and that's the factor right there. That once you have that part, this is the easy part. The showing up and the talking, that's <laughs> that's, that's what you do, bro. So I my route is I went for, I was born in Cuba, Cuba, Spain, here in Miami, uh, North Carolina for a little bit. Then I, I moved to Los Angeles. 
And I was six years in Los Angeles. I lived in a car, bro, for six months. I tried to act. The whole it's it's legendary. But then I moved to a little town called Las Vegas, and I lived in Vegas for four years. And I I started off as a promoter in a club called Hide in the Bellagio. Okay. And from there, I got up to be the VP of Customer Development. It was the it was the biggest professional before I started this highlight of my life, right? Yeah. And the reason why I'm bringing that up is in 2015, when you guys won the World Series, there was a guy that was one of my host client named Vegas Dave. <laughs> I knew you were going there, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Vegas bro. Dave would be at Hyde all the time, bro, all the time, man. Can I tell you a good Vegas Dave story when you're done? Go ahead, go ahead. Oh, give it to me, give it to me. So Talk Vegas to me. Dave, man, we're, so, so we, in 2015, when we're on our playoff run, uh, I was one of the younger guys on the team. I wasn't married, didn't have a family at that time. So we were going out, man. We were having a good time. We were celebrating winning these series and just getting ready to go. So in 2015, we beat Toronto for the ALCS and we're in Kansas City. So we go out in Kansas City and we're there and we had same guys that would be our, our bouncers and we became real cool with them, man. And over the years, like it was just, uh, they were part of the family, man. It was awesome. So one of the guys comes up to me and he goes, hey, man, there's a guy that wants to come in here and, and buy you guys a drink. And he got it a couple of times, man, because Kansas City, they loved us out there. So they were trying to come hang out with us. So he knew, uh, humbly speaking, he knew, like, I'm not going to go approach Eric unless this guy is, is for real. So right. he's like, bro, this guy, I think he's a big Vegas guy. He said he has this thing he wants to show you, whatever, blah, blah, blah. So Vegas Dave comes and showed me, and he's like, hey, I have a big bet on you guys. If you win the World Series, I'll win two point something million dollars. If you end up winning, you ever come to Vegas, call me, man. I'll take care of you and your boys. Let's do it. So sure enough, man, we ended up winning. We're going out to Vegas. And I'm like, dude, let me hit this guy up and see what it's all about. And he showed us a great time out there, man. It was a lot of fun. Dude, there was a so that how that bet went because uh, my boy Akon, Akon was his host. Mm. And Akon would, would bring him in. So you guys were so dominant that it started, I think he placed a bet at the win, if I'm not mistaken. Mm -hmm. And they started reaching out to him, like negotiating. I don't know if you know that, but they do that. Like if they're, because they, no, when you hit a Vegas casino, it destroys them. That's really? why they get banned. Yeah. That's why Dana White, uh, now I was having this conversation with him. Now, recently, Mm -hmm. Are they allowing him to come back in? But he only pretty much plays at uh, the Fertitas place, which is um, Red Rock. Yeah. So that's yeah. his book's place. So they, they let him do whatever he wants. That's why he has cameras there. He does whatever he wants. Whatever. Mm -hmm. So they start calling him. And they're like, look, listen, when, when you guys won the ALCS, we'll give you equal value back. Equal oh, value. And you, and you haven't even won yet. And he held. Wow. When you guys win two games of the World Series, we're going to give you a million back plus this. Nope. So that's you know, why these, man, these I will, he reached out to me when the podcast and all that started. And I was like, man, we should tell the story one time. That'd be fun. Maybe we all link up and tell that story one time. That'd be that'd be a great time, man. Dude, that, it's all this stuff, man. All this stuff. I think the more stories around the stories that are healthy, right? Because look, there's a whole thing about being a single dude mm -hmm. that's good looking, that has all these things. And now, right? It's like, okay, so we were lucky. There's a lot of great things. Dude, imagine now with the thing of everything's on camera, you're a young guy, and then now you're dealing with DMs where everything's on the record, you know, and, and you're and at two in the morning, you're not saying the best text that you should at this and that. So mm -hmm. all these things that people talk about, right, are important, just like transitioning to being a father. Mm -hmm. right and and changing stuff like that so talk to me about that man how hard was it for you or was it super easy to go from single guy to family guy uh no i mean it, it i mean it's a different life it's a different change of life especially taking baseball out of it because you know i've always just been built up in this baseball mentality in the locker room and all that type of thing so now i'm at home for a good chunk of the day and I'm trying to figure out how can I be the best husband? How can I be the best dad? How can I do that? And it's so different because I always tell the story and I always ask guys when they come on my podcast, especially some of the older guys, because the way I led when I was on a team, when I was an older veteran player, I always wanted to pass everything down to every rookie that ever came and played with me. Not only baseball stuff, but going to Vegas, meeting guys like yourself. Hey, if you do want to go and get a dinner or you do want to go have fun, 
call this guy. He's going to take care of you. He's going to make sure you don't get no trouble. He knows that just everything's good. You're taken care of. Boom. So always wanted to do that. Then you have some tough conversations when it comes to the baseball end, man. And at the end yeah. of it, at the end of the day, I would tell some of these older guys, and I would love to ask you about this because I loved every guy that I played with like a brother, man. And I really wanted the best for them. And if I told them something that I knew they didn't like right then and there, I was okay with them not taking it or not liking me in the moment because I know it's going to be the best for them in the long run. And I hope at some point in time, they're going to look back and be like, damn, Haas was right. Or I appreciate Haas doing that for me because I needed some truth when no one else wouldn't give me truth. But now having a son, I'm not willing to give up those two, three days of him not liking me to have that card conversation. So that balance is something that I am certain. No, no, no. You, okay, okay. All right. We got to talk about this, bro. Okay. So listen no. to me, bro. Listen to me. So it all comes from a place of love. Mm -hmm. And the more you win this guy over through the discipline of it. So like, I'll give you an example. My son today, who's three, who's a beast. Mm -hmm. The guy comes the best, bro. The guy comes. That's And he was, uh, your, your son's name's Jackson, right? Jack. Jack, which is a cool name. A Cuban guy named Jack. That's, that's strong, right? So my son's name's Cruz, right? So I, I come and I go, Papo, we got to change your socks. And this dude is rocking these Spider-Man socks that they have the little rubbers on the bottom. And he's yeah. like, no, you can't wear the rubber ones to, to school. He's like, he doesn't want to. He's like, no, no, I want to wear rubbers to school, whatever. So he starts crying, right? Go oh, rubbers. No, no, no. And I'm Jedi mind tricking everybody, <laughs> like everybody, Eric, it doesn't stop, bro. Like yeah. professionally, my son, my wife, everybody gets it. Right. Mm -hmm. So my dad would have said like this, one of said, oh, I point to and he would have just, <laughs> like, that's my dad. Right. But this is 2024. So I come and I go, no, no, we're going to put on the socks. He's crying. We, I take him, I go outside and I go, look, buddy, look, 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 there's a, look, there's a bear out there and there's an elephant and, da, da, da. and in that whole thing, he's crying. He's like, no, there's a, and so that, right. But mm -hmm. the best thing you can do for Jack is discipline first with the love. Mm -hmm. Don't flip it around. I was very good friends. He would be like client in Vegas all the time. Cesar Milan, he would come. We would talk about training dogs. Mm -hmm. And he's like, bro, where people fuck up with the dogs is, they do affection, love, whatever. And then the discipline, and by that time, you have a spoiled dog. Yeah. So where, first thing you, don't, you do is you don't feel sorry for Jack. Mm-hmm. That's the first thing you do. You never, your dad never felt sorry for you. It's like, motherfucker, I'm, I'm doing this. You're doing this, right? Yeah. The more of that you put around him, the happier this guy's going to be. But that. the first person you have to talk to, you got to talk to your chick and mm -hmm. say, babe, I love you more than life. Our son, I love him like anything. This is what he needs, please. Mm -hmm. Because the problem is, and this happened to my boy. I'll show you with this story. So my boy, very famous dude. A comedian, podcaster, out in LA, whatever. His, uh, he's in LA. Okay, he's in uh, Calabasas. Mm -hmm. So all of a sudden, his son starts hanging out with Kim and Kanye's kid. Okay, so when they're at the house, okay, they don't know what's going on. But when they come to his house, the kid's there. Yeah. So the kid's there and they're hanging out, and the kid's on his phone the whole time. So they're having a play date mm -hmm. at eight, nine, whatever old this kid is, seven, whatever. And this kid's on the phone the whole time. Yeah. So now what happens? If you are on to your son, you see that and you go, oh, I don't like that. I don't like that. I don't want my son. This is the worst thing that could happen. This is the best thing in the world. We know each other through this. This is awesome. Social media, everything's great, right? But for kids that don't understand it, Eric, I'm telling you, this is the worst. Dangerous. The worst. It's yeah. dangerous, bro. And, and they get hooked on it because it's trained for them, right? And my boy goes, nah. I'm cutting that relationship out. Even I'm telling you that his mom came and goes, listen, oh, I want to take, because, you know, there's a, when you're at this level, everything is access. Oh, yeah. we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna go around the world because the kid's a soccer player. We're going to go see uh, Messi in Barcelona. We're going to see this guy. Yeah. And my boy, uh, private jet, everything paid for. Mm -hmm. And my boy goes, nah. Wow, man. Right? Strong, so, but he, he knows that's the right move. That's the move. And instinctually, so what I want you to do with Jack is, I want you to watch and instinctually you're going to know this is wrong. Mm -hmm. And then you're going to talk to your chick and go, listen, babe, we got to fix these couple things because, because he's the only one you have, right? Yeah. That's it. We have a little girl in October that's due in October. Yeah. Oh, 
oh, there it is, buddy. So when number two comes, it's going to change. I have to. It's going to change. I have a girl and a boy. It's going to change everything. So you need this guy right now to understand that he's your right-hand man. And how you do that is by making him do things and then celebrate everything. I don't care if this guy fucking picked his boogers and put it in. <laughs> put it in he picked his nose, put it in a paper towel and thrust it down the toilet. You go, oh, man, you're the man. Dude, give me a high five. <laughs> That's how you do it. And don't complain and and that thing bro that thing is huge dude that thing is huge i love it man and 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 i'm sure i want to know if you agree with me on this it is it's never been harder to be a kid right now think of 2020 from the covid stuff to to having to do all that type of stuff that required covid to the instagram social media to putting up a picture i got 20 likes on this to now i only got seven on this picture like it's it's never been harder i feel like they're getting judged on their every single move Eric, it's so many things, bro. It's when we were young, who knew about uh, sex predators? Who knew about a uh, child, uh, the um, child thing that that's that's going on with with the the, the sex workers and all that stuff? Man, I was at the airport yesterday, and over the loudspeaker, they're like, "Oh, so South Florida is one of the biggest things of child trafficking." So please, that's it. So it, so we used to leave. Hey, he came back. Oh, cool, Eric. Oh, go take a shower. You now you have to like. You, it's like, okay, how do I take care of my kid without helicoptering him? Mm -hmm. But I have to let him fail. I have to let him learn how to do social without, buddy, uh, I'm leaving to one of my biggest guys. I'm leaving to Scottsdale next week, every year. He's the reason why this show, I, I have it. He, uh, so I started helping people, just helping people with what I went through. And a guy reaches out to me that his son was about 12 and was thinking about killing himself. And he, and, and he had Googled it on, on, he looked at his, his computer searching how to kill myself. Mm. And he goes, dude, can you talk to me? I go, bro, first of all, I am not a psychiatrist, psychologist, whatever. But uh, of course, man, bring him here. So the guy flew to Miami and I worked with him and I changed the kid's life. We talked and we changed the kid's life. And I didn't know how successful the guy was super successful. And he hooked me up big time for that and asked him for that. And every year he flies me out there and he, boom, he takes care of me. And, and it's awesome. Right. Mm. But. The reason why I want you to talk to your wife a lot is because the communication you're going to have to have with Jack and your daughter's name's what? Like Priscilla or something? What do you call her? Uh, we haven't decided yet. There's okay. about four or five options, but we haven't uh, nailed it down exactly yet, though. Well, I have a Penelope, just in case, and that's a great name. Very pretty name. Penelope's a pretty name. But uh, those are conversations that your dad never had to have with you, that mm -hmm. now you're going to have to have with your wife first. And be like, babe, listen, when 10 of his friends all have a cell phone and they all have social media and they all have this, do you feel in your heart that it's right? When his boys all have uh, BMWs and you're like, nah, man, this guy's going to get the beat down Tahoe from this is that. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's to me, that's the thing, bro. But yeah. I could talk to you forever, man. I could talk to you forever. Hey, bro, same, man. I can ask you question after question. But you're right. You're so right. That, <laughs> Last that's tip. That, uh, and that's the whole thing, too, real quick, too, man. This is something I told. I, my, I'm obsessed. My wife is awesome, man. She's a rock star. She lets me do what I can do or business-wise. She's always supporting me. And, and we have those talks and we're able to have those talks. And that's what I love about it. But <clears throat> When I when Jack was first born in September, I remember calling one of my boys back home and he was like, man, like, you know, how is it? What's it like? Blah, blah, blah. And I was like, bro, what we were looking for in women or for our wife, we weren't even close, bro. Like understanding what the, the female body just went through and having a child, what they go through after the postpartum, bro. Talk and to no me. One tells you, no one tells you about that, bro. No one that just hits you in the face a couple of days after your, your son's born. But to experience what she was going through and how she was handling it and how she was still being a boss around the house, to me, I was like, thank God that she, not only is she beautiful, but she is the way she is because I could not imagine doing it with someone else. And to have a partner, if I felt like that wasn't really doing or picking up her slack or doing her role, I couldn't even imagine. Disaster. No, no, it'd, be, it'd be a disaster. And, and I got lucky, bro. I went the wrong way. I went for the hottest girl that I could find and thank god she turned out to be i went for a 10 and thank god it worked out you know but yeah, it's crazy bro what's your what was your your favorite walk-up song that you had oh uh, so uh my walkout song in kansas city was 
uh, some cut by Trillville. It was a er, 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 what it is. Uh, so it's called through it. I never heard of that. Thrillville. Uh, Trill, some cut is the, is who it is. And then okay. Trillville is the name of the song. All right. Some kind of Trillville, yeah. bro. It's got a cool little beat in the beginning. And then I had it for about two, three years in Kansas city. So it was cool. Dude, that's awesome, bro. Bro, I'm so happy for you, man. I'm I'm so excited. This is only the beginning, dude. We're gonna there's there's so many things that that I'm looking forward to you and and stuff like that, bro. Any before yeah. I let you go, I always ask people for this, man. Question for me, anything I can help you with? I've already hit you with about four or five, my man. But just just that that positivity that you bring, that that attitude that you bring every <laughs> single day, man. How are you so consistent with it? And my thing is, is like. I see it and I see a lot of people be happy and sometimes closed doors. I'm like, man, does it ever hit this guy? Does it ever feel, do you ever feel what I'm feeling or what some of us are feeling? So how do you just maintain that positivity day in and day out? And those times where you're kind of by yourself, you know, do you keep it real with yourself or are you just kind of, do you have something that you do that gets through it? You know who asked me that same question? I spoke at Oregon State in 2018 and I didn't know who anybody was. Mm -hmm. I'm like, I'm the only Cuban out there and I'm in Corvallis. I've never been in Corvallis before. And I'm sitting there, and this dude with these crystal blue eyes, I had no idea who he was, asked me a question. That same question you asked me, he asked me. No kidding. We were done. Sends me a DM. I didn't know who he is. I didn't answer it. The coach calls me and goes, bro, you crushed the speech, isn't that? He goes, you know who that guy was that asked you all those questions? I, I go, no. He goes, that's Adley Rushman, the projected number one overall pick of the 20, 20 uh, whatever, 18 draft, whatever. Oh, yeah. so, yesterday, I am in Brooklyn. I left here. At, I woke up at my son. Had me up there like about because I, I, my chick had my daughter. I'm with him. I woke up like about two something in the morning. I head to Fort Lauderdale Airport from here. I live in Miami, Fort Lauderdale Airport. The flight from six to nine, take an hour flight, take an hour drive to Brooklyn, speak, take an hour traffic back to speak again. All these things, right? What I do, Eric, is I'm so happy to even be alive that nothing matters i got into the worst accident of my life like they my car got wrecked bro the minute that accident happened that it was done that god forbid that i got so nothing happened to me my car got wrecked i go i wouldn't change a fucking single thing to me that's happiness that's how i tell myself always and when i fuck up that i do all the time i go you know what i tried mm-hmm now that comes from a lot of things, right? I, my whole life, I never had anything growing up. So uh, Eric was the guy that had the best bat. My dad never got me anything. And I would always celebrate your bat. I'd be like, yeah, it's a good bat. So I never worry about myself. I always worry about others. And when you do that, it's never poor me. It's bro, look at that dude. You're the champion, man. You got a hot podcast. I'm not focused on my podcast. I go, I celebrate you, man. Go get them. What, what, what more can we do? We should do this. Should do that. That's the move, bro. That's the move. You know what I'm saying? I'm holding, I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna send people your way. I'm gonna end this and I'm gonna tell you two things off the air that I'm gonna end it out. But hold on, don't go anywhere. Yeah, you're the man. Don't go anywhere. Do not go anywhere. Hold on. <laughs> you see you're still there.